All right, and I'm going to share my screen and get started. All right, can everybody see that? The welcome slide, <laughs> hopefully that's up. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, this is part of a, this is the second workshop in our on farm risk management and technology series. And I'd like to welcome you all this, this evening. And my name is Jennifer Hashley. I'm the director of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project, which I'll tell you about in a second. We'd love for folks, um, if you don't mind, putting um, some introductions in the chat. You're welcome to add your name, your pronouns, your farm name, uh, where you're located um, and coming from tonight. And if you'd like to rename yourself, um, just so folks kind of know who you are, if sometimes we all log on to Zoom and find out that we're our children or our business or something else. So whatever name you'd like to use for yourself tonight with your pronouns, if you could please um, rename yourself, that would be helpful when we have our Q&A at the end. Um, we just ask that you mute yourself until we open it up for questions and answers, but we encourage you to ask questions in the chat as we go. So if one of the presenters is sharing information and you have a question about it, feel free to pop it in the chat at the moment and we'll definitely get back to it um, so you don't lose your question or forget to ask it at a later time. We are recording the session so that folks who are unable to make it um, can view it on the website later. So if you don't feel comfortable being on the screen recorded, um, you're welcome to turn your video off. But when we do the Q&A, we'd love for you to have it on so the speakers can see who you are, which is always more fun to talk to, uh, <laughs> to faces than black boxes. So um, thanks for doing that. So just a quick little overview of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. Our mission really is to train beginning farmers, um, the next generation of farmers to improve our local and regional food systems and to grow healthy food that is accessible to everyone. So that's really what we're all about. And this workshop series is part of helping farmers learn more to manage risks and be more economically viable. And our main program areas, I'm just giving a little spiel because if any of you wanna access other things that New Entry offers, we want you to know about them so that you feel free to sign up for other, uh, other programs that we do. So our three main programs are our farmer training programs, our food hub, and we run a couple of national networks that help build capacity for other organizations that do land-based farmer training. So a little bit about our farmer training programs. We offer courses, um, three different courses, which I'll talk touch on briefly. We do other workshops throughout the year, like this series that we're doing now on food safety. We've done some on direct marketing, record keeping, and we run an incubator farm program here in Beverly, Massachusetts, where we make land accessible to farmers for up to three years who come through our business planning course. So our next Explore Farming workshop is happening in, on November 30th. So if folks want to take that course, I encourage you to sign up for it on our website. It's free. And then in the summer, we do three five week um, long hands on workshops on the farm and with an online component as well. But if you need to get your hands in the dirt and learn a little bit more about growing, um, we do some hands on uh, field based training on our demonstration plot here on the incubator farm. That'll start up in May. And then we're also um, getting ready to close out our farm business planning course for the fall session. But the winter session starts again in early January. So if you are interested in developing a business plan through a training course like that, um, it's online um, this year, and you can sign up for that on our website as well. And then uh, if you want a tour of the farm and, or any of our other educational training programs, you can check those out on our website and YouTube channel. Um, our Food Hub program runs an aggregation and distribution facility with a CSA and some food access work. And we also do market-based training. So you may see some programming coming out of our food hub this winter, specifically around food safety and value-added production. So I wanna let you know about that. And then these are our national programs. We just um, wrapped up our national conference that was part of the National Farm Viability Conference. We do a field school every year in the fall. And this year, since it was virtual, we partnered with the National Farm Viability Conference. But if any of you are ever interested in learning more about starting or running an incubator or apprenticeship training program, I highly recommend you to check out a lot of our toolkits and educational resources and the listserv to network with other folks doing this across the country. So without further ado, I uh, just wanna let everyone know that these um, workshop sessions that we're doing um, are broken up into different risk management categories. So the first few workshops we're doing really focus around legal risk and about finding um, and leasing or purchasing farmland. So that's our legal risk, um, legal risk workshop 
series. So last week we did a legal considerations for expanding your farm business. That recording is posted to our website. Tonight we'll hear about um, financial readiness, about finding and fi um, financing farmland. And next week we'll really focus into lease building um, to acquire farmland. And then we transition to our financial risk series around tracking and analyzing data. So we'll go through a bunch of different software programs that help farmers do that. We'll hear from folks from FarmOS and FarmBright, and we'll talk about um, transitioning from Excel to QuickBooks and all the analysis tools behind the scenes around that. And then in early January, we'll start um, jumping into looking at point of sale materials. So how do you use your point of sale data to really make financial management decisions? Um, and then we'll work on production risks. So we'll talk again about some other good record keeping and how you can use those on-farm or the software tools to develop enterprise budgets to make decisions. And then thinking about what are some record keeping tools if you're really um, trying to track soil health metrics or um, uh, track data for organic certification. And then lastly, we'll wrap up this series with our marketing risk series, really around the, all these online sales platforms. There's so many out there. So we'll kick that off with the Farmer and Food Hub panel about which e-commerce panel platform is right for me. And you'll hear from a bunch of different folks who use a variety of programs. And then we'll spend the next three sessions really diving into the nitty gritty of the various software platforms and hear from both the, um, the companies that promote them and farmers that use them. So that's a little bit about the series. All of these will be, um, all the resources and links will be posted on our website. So you can go to the resources tab of the new entry website and click in the farmer resource library and outside a little wing will show up and the bottom of that will be the ag technology platform tab. And you can get access to the registration and the links and the follow-up resources to all of these workshops. And just thanks to our funder, the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Program, which is funded through the USDA National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. And so that's why all these workshops are free. And thank you to them for funding that. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, the funder does require that we evaluate and make sure that folks learn something from these workshops. So I'm gonna launch a couple of polls to ask some questions about what you know about the topic before the workshop starts. And then um, we'll hear from our presenters and then I'll pop up a two question poll at the end. And just a, um, as a follow-up, when I send out the recording and any other resources that are referenced throughout the session tonight, there'll be a quick um, few question workshop evaluation about the content. And then um, we'll probably be sending out after all the series um, have ended in March, kind of an, another like, what did you do with this information? Have you taken any follow-up actions? So we really appreciate your participation and responding to those very short, very quick surveys, but really help us demonstrate to the funder that these are a valuable, um, valuable series to put on. So without further ado, I'm gonna um, stop sharing and just launch the first two questions. Then I'm gonna introduce our speakers and then we will spend the rest of the time learning together. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and launch the first poll. It's two questions uh, about rating your knowledge about finding farmland is the first question on a scale of one to five with one being don't have a lot of knowledge about finding farmland or number five, you're an expert at finding farmland. And then the second question is, um, how would you rate your knowledge about financing farmland, paying for it? So one is no knowledge and five is expert. So just two quick questions. All right, I think we've got everybody and I guess Jay and Mike, I don't think you're answering the question, so that's fine. <laughs> you don't have to, you're the experts already. Great, so I think everybody um, responded to the poll, so I'm gonna end the poll and you'll see those questions again at the end. So thank you for that. Um, and then just quickly to introduce our speakers. I am really grateful to have um, both Jay and Mike join us tonight. So Jay Silverman is the Massachusetts field agent with Land for Good, and he's got a lot of experience helping farmers navigate the land search process and a lot of great tools he's going to walk us through, and I'll let him introduce himself in just a second. And then Mike Parker, Parker oh my God, Mike Parker, uh, Michael Parker is going to follow that up, and he's um, had many roles, um, both we got to know each other over the years um, in your work with the National Young Farmers Coalition, and now you're working with the Department of Ag Resources, and both of you guys are farmers, so also bring a lot of your own personal experience to tonight's workshop. So thank you both for being here, and you can take it away, Jay. 
Sure, thanks. No, I appreciate uh, yeah, appreciate you all being here and joining us tonight. Um, so let's see, I'll start a screen share real quick. Make sure that's coming through okay. Um, okay, great. So yeah, my name is Jay Silverman. I'm the Massachusetts field agent for Land for Good. Um, so Land for Good is a nonprofit that operates in all six New England states. Uh, we have field agents that cover each state. So I cover Massachusetts, but I live and farm in Conway, Mass. So the Western part of the state, um, just one town out of the Connecticut River Valley, kind of in the Greenfield, Amherst area. Um, and so for my portion of tonight, I wanted to focus on kind of tools and resources specifically for your farmland search, um, different criteria to be looking for, and then how you go about kind of assessing those farmland opportunities as they come up. Um, so really Land for Good is, you know, we're, we're a nonprofit and we focus on working with um, farm seekers, landowners, and transitioning farmers in order to keep farmland in farming. Um, we do this through a lot of one-on-one -on -one assistance, through workshops and educational events, policy advocacy. And, um, but yeah, so the three buckets are really folks that are already farming and might be looking towards succession planning, uh, bringing in the next generation. Oftentimes the next generation is not even identified. So they're trying to find someone to take over their farm. Um, we work with farm seekers. So people that are looking to get on land or looking to improve their land tenure. So if they already are on a farm, but are looking to expand or to get a written lease or anything like that, we do a lot of work with that. And then on the flip side, we work with non-farming landowners. So folks that own farmland, um, sometimes it's just an acre or two with their house that they wanna get somebody on uh, producing food, all the way up to people that have inherited a farm or purchased a whole farm and aren't farmers themselves, but are interested in leasing it out or, or selling it. Um, and that includes a lot of uh, you know state and municipal land as well. So really you know through these this kind of three-legged stool both through one-on-one -on -one ta and um you know outreach and education just trying to help keep farmland in production um as there's a lot of other factors competing with farmland use these days with development and everything else um so a little bit about myself i'm a hay farmer out here in conway um i've been a, a hay nut since i was two so i'm a first generation farmer i just finished my 10th season which is crazy to say um but you know coming to this work with land for good i've been uh, with the organization for about four years and um, it's been really fun to kind of weave in my own experiences as a first generation farmer, all of my acreage is leased. So I'm operating entirely with non-farming landowners and piecing together a business um, in, in my hometown. So it's, it's been, um, yeah, it's been fun to work with different folks and, and learn the different aspects and different ways they're approaching land access and, and farm use and kind of, um, you know, weave those common threads throughout. So from, from my portion, you know, as I mentioned, really talking about uh, preparedness for a farm, farmland search. It can be really tempting to jump straight into a search, but we really try to do a lot of prep work with folks to make sure that you're ready for that search and know what questions to ask and know what, what sort of prep to be doing. Um, wanted to talk about plenty of tools and strategies for the farmland search itself, and then also how to evaluate that land and try to help figure out if a particular property or parcel is right for you in your operation. Um, and I absolutely have a, a PDF of this presentation that I think was, was provided as part of the resource packet. And if for whatever reason you don't get that, um, I'm always available via email. And so if, if you want a, a PDF of this, happy to share it so you don't feel like you need to scramble and write everything down. Um, so land tenure itself, usually we're talking about the options of owning land or leasing land. Um, but one really important thread is that it can be some of each. A lot of folks can kind of get hung up on whether they want to own or lease. And there's plenty of situations where people own a home farm and lease additional acreage. Um, you know, leasing or renting land can help you grow into your business, grow into your space. Um, and it's a strategy I, I take with my own farm where I own just enough to have everything home for the winter time and then lease all my additional acreage. Um, but, you know, for each person's situation, it, it can really depend. Some folks have, have things very consolidated and want to own or, or rent one parcel. And it can absolutely change over time. Folks can sometimes start out leasing, build up their business, figure out what they want to do, figure out what size they want to be at, and then move on to owning land at some point. Um, there's all kinds of different scenarios that can pop up. So it's really, there's no one best answer. It all has to do with your criteria and what opportunities um, you're faced with. So one uh, tool I wanted to, to pass along is this farm access methods guide we have on the Land for Good website that really kind of talk, walks you through these different options. And if you're still trying to figure out what strategy is best for you, um, it can focus on ownership now, which is simply, you know, purchasing farmland ownership in the future, which might be leasing or lease to own or other kinds of creative arrangements. And um, the no ownership option, which could be long-term leasing, um, could be a cooperative or, or other, um, you know, other creative ways to get land access. So if that's something you're wanting to dig into, I, I definitely recommend that guide and it walks you through and ranks each one. Um, 
And you know, one of the, the resources within it is this idea of breaking down the bundle of rights or bundle of sticks with land ownership and kind of seeing how that's parsed out through different land tenure examples. Um, you know, sole ownership can be pretty straightforward. You have all those rights, you can do whatever is legal on the property. Um, and then, you know, by comparison, a leasehold interest, you have a, a you know, particular legal right to be there for a specified amount of time, but the landowner has pretty much the rest of those rights on the property. Um, so I think it'd be a really useful thought exercise, especially if you're trying to figure out what situation is best for you and how it ranks through different criteria. Uh, again, that, that's that's on our website. And if you know, I'm always available to help help curate resources for people if you have any questions at any point. Um, so as I mentioned, it can be really tempting to just dive out there and start searching for farmland properties. And it's, you know, it's a great idea to start seeing what's out there. But um, I've worked with plenty of people where it can kind of snowball. You, you just start looking, then you see what looks like the absolutely perfect property or someone that you don't want to pass up. You reach out to the landowner before you know it, you're going to see it. And then you're trying to figure out if it can, you know, be leased or fit into your, uh, you know, your purchase budget without necessarily having all of your prep work done to figure out, wait, is this actually the right property? Um, so one thing we do with a lot of our one-on-one -on -one TA with folks is help to figure out this prepared process before um, making inquiries about a property. One thing that's absolutely key with that is business planning. Um, whatever aspects of business planning that you can do without having the property identified, knowing what scale you're going to be at, what your markets should look like, well, what you're growing, what you're producing. And um, luckily, there's a lot of great organizations uh, around the country, aside those of you introducing yourselves from different different areas, um, but especially in New England, we have a lot of great agricultural business planning courses, uh, new entry being one prime example. Um, you know, they, their, their course has been extremely helpful to folks I've worked with. Same thing with the Mass Department of Ag, they've got a wonderful business planning course. Um, same story, <laughs> people go through that and really, you know, are, are much more prepared to take the next, next steps with their farming. Um, and then likewise, Carrot Project, and, uh, you know, there, there's several um, organizations out there that can help you through this and help you figure out you know, what you can afford. And that can really help inform your land search process to know that you're getting a property that will work out for your business's beginning stages and that you can grow into. Uh, so I certainly can't stress that enough. And getting going on that and getting a rough draft going is, is better than nothing. Um, so that can be really helpful. Next is, you know, part of that obviously is how much acreage do you need, but also what type of soils do you need? Um, you know, are you doing grass farming? Like with, with my haying business, I can grow hay on a lot of different types of topography and soil types even have fields that have rocks in them with stakes that I mow around versus if uh, you know, you're trying to do intensive vegetable production, you might need much more prime, flat, well-drained soil. Um, so we'll talk about some tools on, on how to assess that, but kind of figuring out what your operation needs before you start looking at different properties uh, can be really, really helpful. And then of course, you, know, you have some basics with your farming business. Um, what sort of infrastructure do you need? Do you need housing on the farm? Are you planning on relocating or do you want it to be commutable to where you're currently living? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, some folks want to wait and see what a property has available to them before they decide what kind of farming. Um, but to get as good of clear of an idea as you can to help whittle that down is really helpful. And then, as I mentioned too, having room to grow. Uh, if you find the property that's perfect on year one, it might be kind of too small and constraining on future years. Um, so making sure it has that flexibility too. So when we talk about these farm search priorities, uh, one exercise we really lean on is this necessary, desirable, optional exercise. And uh, as you're coming up with your farm business and business plan and figuring out what you wanna be looking for in a property, we try to break each of those aspects down into what is absolutely necessary for you. So things that are a deal breaker if the property doesn't have it. Um, what things are desirable, things you'd really like to see in a property, but there might be a little bit of flexibility or ways you can shoehorn something if it doesn't quite have that attribute. And then things that are optional, things you want to keep track of that you love your dream property to have, but ultimately at the end of the day, aren't really going to um, you know, be a major deciding factor on whether or not you choose a property. So we have this available in spreadsheet format. Here's an example from a farmer I worked with um, that you know, really looking at each aspect of their land search and figuring out um, where they absolutely needed to draw the line and keeping track of the other criteria too. And the one thing that's great about this is it can not only get all your thoughts down on paper and help make that unicorn farm you've been dreaming about um, feel a little bit more manageable and, and really hone in on what the key aspects are. Um, also, this can be a great shareable document when you're um, doing grassroots organizing and talking to other people and trying to find farmland and people keep asking, what are you looking for? This can be a great document to share with them and actually spell out very clearly what your criteria are for your search strategy. Um, 
So once you're feeling, you know, prepped and somewhat ready, I mean, the, the idea of business planning and your search criteria can definitely be an evolving process. But once you have some of those baseline ideas down and you have a better sense of what your needs are and what you're looking for, um, there's several strategies to try to find farmland. One thing that we lean on pretty heavily is the New England Farmland Finder, as well as a few different state-specific sites in New England, which is Vermont, Connecticut, and Maine, that we all collaborate as part of the um, New England Farmland Collaborative. But luckily, there's other organizations around the country. You've got Carol, um, California FarmLink, Georgia FarmLink. I mean, there are um, plenty, plenty of New York. So if pretty much any region that you're in, you can do a search and try to find what kind of farm linking sites are available. Um, if you, and if you have any trouble finding them, absolutely feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to point you towards them. There's an ever-growing network and it's so great to see more and more sites popping up doing that where they essentially try to post properties that are for sale or lease and uh, point farmers to them that can pursue it. Um, along with that, there's absolutely different publications, you know, as many journals and articles and, and platforms you can post ads in. We'll talk a little bit about doing uh, some, some flyers and promotional material. And then absolutely, you know, pursuing classic real estate listings can definitely be a good place to look. Um, they won't be the be all end all of farmland opportunities. Oftentimes they're much more house centric, um, but it can be a great way to just kind of keep your eye peeled. So as you're, you know, figuring out your search criteria, looking at these and seeing what's out there can help to refine that quite a bit. So diving into the New England Farmland Finder, and again, this is an example of um, a farm linking site that, um, you know, like I said, has been replicated around the country in, in different ways. Some are more in depth, some are, not, are less. I, one of the hats I wear at Land for Good is I'm actually the site administrator for New England Farmland Finder. Um, so it's really, you know, nice working with landowners and helping to figure out how to facilitate getting their properties online. Um, the way we have it set up is that as a farm seeker, you can search properties by all kinds of different criteria. You can look at a map, you can try to figure out, you know, what acreage base you need, whether or not there's water sources present, or even the type of tenure arrangement somebody's looking for, if they're looking to lease out their farmland versus sell it. Um, and the other thing you can do is not only sign up as a property poster to post properties, but if you subscribe as a farm seeker, it's a free service, uh, you get a once a week email of all the new properties that pop up. So it's a way to kind of keep your eye to it without feeling like you have to keep coming back to the website and seeing if anything new has popped up. Um, the postings themselves, as opposed to a real estate listing site, this is a posting site and we try to really focus on all of the specific criteria for farmland and what a farmer you know, might wanna know about it. And as you look at your production plan, your business plan, and parse out how this meets your criteria. So breaking it down between tillable land, pasture, forested land, which is quite common in New England, um, and then all kinds of different criteria about the farm. Now, granted, this, this is not vetted. We try to work with the um, farmland owners and property posters to make sure things make sense when they post something, but a lot of it you know, comes down to their communication with the farm seeker. So as a subscribed farm seeker and sign up for the site, um, you're able to contact these posters directly. And that's the way that a lot of the farm seeking um, and farm linking sites around the country are set up is allowing at least that initial contact to happen through the site. Um, so that way you as the seeker can contact a property poster, tell them a bit about yourself and hopefully get a dialogue going. Um, so along with all of the various online resources, um, which you know can be a great place to start and a really tempting place to dive into, it's also really important to look at the grassroots angle and to try to figure out what kind of on the ground networking you can do. Because a lot of landowners um, aren't actually turning to the online medium as their safe space and their comfort zone for actually posting these property postings. Um, I've been doing workshops with landowners and farm succession workshops where somebody will raise their hand and say, nobody's interested in my land. There's no farmers anymore. And I can just hear, you know, all the farm seekers out there crying in despair that they're not aware of these opportunities. Um, and that, you know, that's even a thing people think. And it's kind of becomes this AM FM radio situation where many landowners are not, um, they're not even aware there's farm seekers online looking. So you can subscribe to as many different online sites as you want, but um, you won't necessarily reach everybody. So that's where it can put you in a really good position as a farm seeker to try to reach them on the ground. Um, and that can be through making a, you know, making a flyer, both physically and electronic to circulate around to different organizations it can actually be a really helpful grassroots way to catch someone's attention, make yourself known, make your story known. Um, so here's one that I've worked with. And it's really trying to catch that you know, 10 second attention span of somebody walking past a, a bulletin board 
And um, some of them might be sitting on farmland that doesn't know what they're going to do with it. They don't have a next generation who's interested in it. And they're in this quandary of, you know, who's going to keep farming my land? Am I going to be able to sell it to someone? Or do we want to continue owning it and lease it to someone? Um, and this puts you in a prime position where you're not actually competing against somebody else for their listing or their posting. Um, you know, they might be kind of passively sitting on it and thinking, oh, we really need to get around to this someday. And this can give them a way to engage with you, learn a little bit about you, and hopefully learn just enough that they want to reach out and learn more. Um, so if that's something you want to work on, we try to um, glean as many examples of this as possible. And I'm always happy to share more and to give feedback and, and help folks on, um, you know, putting themselves out there in this capacity. So along with that, um, I mentioned this can be shared as an electronic PDF as well. So it uh, not only can you print it out and go hang it up at places that you're, uh, you know, interested in farmland, um, you know, different towns you're looking at, but the broader your search, the more difficult that can be. It can be kind of intimidating to think where can I print up a stack of these and hang them all up. Um, so being able to circulate it as a PDF means you can target the commissions of those towns. You can let the state know, you can reach out to land trusts that service the, or the, the different regions you're interested in and try to get the word out there. And again, just like that necessary, desirable, optional worksheet, it's another great thing that can just give people a really good snapshot of who you are and what you're looking for and give them something they can pass on to other people if they know landowners. Um, and then of course, in the meantime, getting farming experience, however you can, while you're doing this whole searching process, not only gives you practice and helps you figure out what you wanna do and, and learn from mistakes, but it's such a great networking tool. And the, you know, the more you work for other farms or volunteer or start something small in your backyard, the more people you meet and the more connections you get. Um, and oftentimes in this farmland search, serendipity reigns, but it takes you know, um, active input to make it happen. And so folks that are sitting back and waiting for the perfect thing to pop up, might not get as many different opportunities as someone that's really out there trying to engage and trying to, to farm at whatever scale they can. Um, you know, of course, that meets your, your life and lifestyle goals. So once you've found a piece of land um, and or found a piece of land that you're interested in looking at further, you know, it's all great to know all of these different properties that are available and know, to know your search criteria, but um, it can be really important to ground truth what, um, what a particular property owner says they have available. And so uh, two key areas we really like to hone in on there are acreage and soils. And I wanted to share a couple of online tools you can do use to look at both acreage and soils. Um, and these are two aspects where different landowners have different perceptions of what their land is capable of. Um, Acreage can be a really big misnomer where folks, they're either looking at what their total property amount is and say, oh, you know, the whole property is 80 acres, but they're not really clear on how much of that's open, how much of that's pasture, how much is forested. Um, or if you're looking to lease a smaller chunk of a property, they might refer to the back 10 acre field. And um, in reality, it's actually smaller than that. Um, and similar stuff with soils, which we'll talk about. So um, one tool that we use a lot is Google My Maps, which is built into the Google Suite. And it is similar to Google Maps, but it's its own thing where it uses the satellite layer and then allows you to mark it up, draw shapes, uh, measure distances, measure areas, color code things. Um, you can make different layers that show and then hide again. So people plan out farm maps on this. And it's fully shareable, like anything else in the Google Suite. So if you're working with somebody else, if you've got a partner, um, or if you're you know, working with a landowner and you're trying to map out their property for a lease that you're working on, or even to make sure you understand their acreage, you can send it to them and say, hey, did I get this right? And they can make edits and send it back to you. Um, but one reason this is really important, like I mentioned, is acreage can be miscalculated or, or misrepresented. So in that 10 acre field example I mentioned, you know, they can be referring to the back 10 acres and maybe that's what their parents called it. Maybe that's what their grandparents called it. And it used to be 10 acres. But in reality, the tree line has moved in a bit every year. Every time they mow it, they have to duck under new branches, new trees pop up. And in reality, the stone wall that used to be the field edge is now 20 feet into the woods and the, the field is maybe only seven or eight acres. And that can be a big deal if your whole production system is reliant on needing that 10 open acres. So just using this to really kind of ground truth what's there um, and make sure that it makes sense can be really helpful because it's not necessarily that landowners are trying to be dishonest. They just might not have a great sense of exactly what they have. Um, and likewise, we use this tool with the landowners themselves when they're trying to find a farmer to also clarify that and really you know, um, make it very clear what's available. And again, this, this fits both for leasing and for purchasing. Um, 
So we've developed kind of a two page walkthrough on how to use this, especially for calculating acreages and um, doing farmland mapping. So this is on our website also, um, but if you're having any trouble finding it, uh, reach out to me and I'm happy to point you towards it. And I also you know, work with people on screen shares and really kind of go through this piece at a time to figure out the exact way to map. Um, and it can be really helpful for leases, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. So along with acreage, um, looking at soils is another key piece of it. And another key piece that landowners could perhaps misunderstand depending on their experience with their own land. Um, so the soil survey to me should be one of the other wonders of the world in a lot of ways where the USDA took soil cores all across the continental US and came up with these really in-depth soils maps that um, they're not completely accurate necessarily, but they're pretty darn close. And if you're looking at a big enough area, it can tell you uh, quite clearly a lot of different aspects about the soil. And so um, this can be a really, really helpful tool if a property pops up and before you even go to visit it, you wanna learn more about it and what's going on under, um, you know, underfoot essentially because some property owners, especially ones that aren't farmers themselves and maybe the land hasn't been um, produced on for a while, they might see an open field and start saying, oh, you can grow vegetables here, you can do whatever you want. And in reality, you know, there's actually a lot of rocks lurking under there and it, maybe the soil is not quite well enough drained, or maybe it's too well drained, maybe there's more slope to it than you realize because all of these pictures we're looking at on Google Earth make everything look flat. And as we know, in New England, not much is flat. <laughs> and I, get, I um, totally fall victim to that too. I'll be working with a landowner, looking at their property, and then go to see it and go, oh, wow, that's way more of a hill than I was you know, expecting. Um, so the nice thing about the web soil survey is it will help to tell you different slopes um, and all kinds of different criteria. So the web soil survey is, is the online adaptation of the soil survey. And it can be really helpful to make these quite, um, you know, quite nice looking maps. You can print them out, they have different keys. Um, but the one downside to it is it can be a little bit difficult to use and to get quick snapshots. If you're cycling through a bunch of different properties and you want to learn stuff about it quickly, um, it can be a little bit more cumbersome. So another tool that we really lean on uses the exact same data, the same sur uh, soil survey da data is the UC Davis soil web tool. And you know this is maybe a, a little bit, um, not as easy to print out, not as color coded, but it allows you to just punch in an address and start clicking around immediately and learning about it, which um, is invaluable to me when I'm working with farmers, working with landowners, and for folks that are looking at multiple different properties and trying to learn stuff about it. So in this particular example, you know, you, you can click around anywhere in these, each of these blobs is a different soil type. I happen to click here and right away on the left, it tells you a bunch of information that you can, you know, go as in-depth as you want or stay as zoomed out as you want. Biggest thing here is that saying that this is 15 to 25% slopes and rocky, which you would never know looking at the soil map. So if I'm a vegetable farmer and I'm curious about this property and I see this kind of nice green open spot and think, oh, could that work well for intensive vegetable production? Well, at 15 to 25% slopes and rocky, that might be difficult to do. Um, it'll also indicate whether or not the land is prime farmland, which can kind of be a general um, general category for what uh, you know what the land is suitable for, drainage, th uh, drainage categories. And then you can really dive um, further in and learn more about each individual soil type that is represented there. So similar to the acreage mapping, um, we put together a, a walkthrough basically to help you take a sample property and start to um, learn all of the different facets about it as you click through it, learn about different ways that soils are rated in the category one through seven and where all these different um, you know, classifiers such as well-drained or excessively drained, that kind of thing. So um, once again, this is something I'm always happy to work with people on. And this tool works you know, anywhere in the country, um, as far as I'm aware, I, haven't, I guess I haven't tested it in every single state, but it's, uh, it's, it's data that's a, across the nation. As you, you, know, you can tell, it's a California tool, but it, it works out here um, and definitely recommend that and getting familiar with it. And again, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, to be helpful with that. Um, so acreage and soils, two really large pieces of a property and knowing what's going on. Um, and to help you decide whether or not a property is right for you and your business. Um, along with that are the various other bits that you've been trying to parse together in your, whether you use the necessary desirable optional exercise, or you just have that in your head or your different criteria. Um, looking at a property and saying, you know, does it, can I access it well enough? Uh, that's you know, for the sake of what kind of roads lead to it. Can I get the equipment that I need in it? Um, and you know, I, is this property out in the middle of the no, out in the middle of nowhere, where it's going to be hard to get the support services, and you actually get my produce to market, or is it right near the things that I need? 
um, you know, different aspects of where the property is situated in the world can really make or break a certain location, um, you know, depending on your needs and depending how much you need that kind of support and visibility uh, versus, you know, if you really want to be secluded and, and produce without any prying eyes, that could be another important factor with the same type of farm, but in a completely different locale. So that's where we try to have folks kind of bring this exercise back around when they're looking at properties, refer back to the search criteria and for each one, try to map, okay, what does it hit? What does it miss? You know, is this a good enough property for me to really consider? You know, it might have my absolute dream barn that I'd love, to, you know, I've been dreaming about a barn just like this. I can set up a walk, wash and pack station, do everything I need to, but uh, maybe the acreage doesn't actually line up with what you need or the soil types don't match. Um, so using this, refining it and getting new ideas and coming back to it can be a really helpful part of the search process that can be somewhat cyclical. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so we're, we're certainly gonna do a good amount of Q&A and, and discussion at the end of this. So I don't wanna <laughs> overload you all with too many resources. Um, but we, uh, you know, on our website, we have a lot of different toolbox resources. We call them toolboxes and we break them down into farm seeking, um, being a non-farming landowner, looking for succession help or lease building. And I just wanted to call attention to a couple of them that are in there. Um, the asset farm, farmland access methods guide that I mentioned, we also have um, an acquiring your farm tutorial that's sort of an interactive um, multi module tutorial about starting your farmland search, going a bit more in depth in each of these pieces that I talked about. Um, some bits about financing, although Mike will go into that a lot, a lot greater detail. Um, also, the mapping walkthroughs that I mentioned. And we've got lots of other stuff like a build a lease tool that I'll talk about more in depth in a couple of weeks and guides for landowners. So, if you're working with a, a farmland owner that's looking for assistance on things too, you know, we have some of this flip side information for their consideration and ways to go about making their land available. Um, and then certainly want to make a plug for, for what Mike's talking about, because um, we utilize the National Young Farmers Coalition um, purchase and sale resources quite a bit. They have a lot of information about buying farmland. You know, that, that is a lot of the work we do is, is helping coach people through the farmland search, regardless of whether looking to lease or purchase and get them teed up with the right resources of purchasing is their um, you know, preferred option or, or fits exactly what they're looking for. Um, but National Young Farmers Coalition has some great resources. And even this farm real estate transaction step by step is this nice, simple way to block out how does farm real estate work? If you're looking to buy a property, what are the steps you need to take? Um, and I'll let, <laughs> I'll let Mike speak more to these resources, but definitely in making plug that, uh, you know, there's some great synergy and, and great folks out there that look forward to helping. Um, so with that, I'm, ha I'm happy to pass it off to Mike, um, but then we can, you know, certainly discuss and, and have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So, thanks. You wanna, if there's anybody that has questions about anything that Jay just went through specifically, we can stop for a minute too, if you wanna do questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull the chat up, so whatever works. Thank you so much, Jay. That was great. I learned some new new tools as well. <laughs> Does anyone have any immediate questions that folks want to ask about anything that Jay just covered? Or do we want Michael to jump right in and we can ask lots of questions at the end? Feel free to unmute yourself if you prefer to ask it live versus in the chat, but. Shall I take it away? Sure. All right. Let's take it away. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Mike Parker. Uh, I am here today representing the National Young Farmers Coalition. Uh, though I no longer work for the for NYFCA, um, worked there for about four years, starting in 2017, and uh, left the coalition this year when I um, started a farm actually out in Cooperstown, New York. So that's where I'm calling in from, is Central New York, where I have a small grass-fed beef um, herd and getting a farm started up here on leased land. Um, besides my work at the, or at least my past work at the coalition, my work farming, I work for the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. So I run a small uh, farm viability grant program there um, for farms that are on uh, conserved land and it's conserved by the state. Um, and then I also work for a co-op called Farm Generations that runs some e-commerce software. Um, and I want to stop for Kamar's attention to, for Kamar's um, 
question too. Jay, do you want to take that before I jump into my stuff? Oh, sure. Yep. Oh, gladly. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, th thanks for that question. Yes, absolutely. We, uh, we work a lot with farm seekers and landowners on lease negotiations. Um, so yeah, uh, and there's, there's lots of different tools we use to do that that I'll talk about in a couple of weeks, but, um, but yes, definitely trying to get both parties to sit down, figure out what they need for a current situation and try to get to an agreeable outline before going and turning it into a legal lease document that, that everybody agrees with. So thanks for asking. Cool. So my, um, the work that I did, the Young Farmers Coalition, was creating this program called uh, Finding Farmland, which consists mostly of a course and a, this calculator tool, which we'll go through both of them today. Uh, at the same time, I was doing workshops all around the country with farmers um, in different places, like full day workshops before a conference, going through a lot of this content. And the point of the course that we're going to go through, it's just a free online course that is all the content that we would put in a full day workshop on land access and a lot more. Uh, so there's like guest speakers that are there on um, like basically little podcast interviews and there's um, there's articles, and there's activities and all that. So the, the idea is that we wanted to make that information accessible to people who weren't able to come to, you know, one of our workshops that was taking place over the course of three years. Um, before I jump into all that though, uh, I do wanna just like take a moment to for one, appreciate the like topic, the like whole series here, and it's um, it's framing of risk management. All these concepts in terms of risk management, because that is the thing that I always try to um, get pe into people's heads when they're thinking about farmland access, especially farmland access as beginning farmers who are planning businesses. Uh, just thinking about how this is, you know, as much as it's like a business planning process or a financial planning process, it's really like a risk assessment and a risk mitigation process, I think. And I think that's the key thing to remember for, um, for farmers that are in this situation. And I'd say like in this situation is like, you know, we live in a country where like, this is, this is like a problem of privilege land and farmland access where, you know, all the farmland in the United States was forcibly taken from indigenous peoples it has been since then hoarded by a capitalist class that, you know, doesn't, it is rent seeking and wants to keep that land for themselves. And so we're in that kind of, you know, it, unless you're, you're being handed down some of that, that land for your family, or you have the capital from somewhere else to be able to acquire that and not use all the capital that you need to also start a business, you're in some kind of disadvantaged state. Um, and so I think that the, I, for one, it's necessary to just have that like risk mitigation um, perspective and plan when you're going through acquiring farmland for the first time because it is really risky. Anything that you do wrong could potentially sink your business and not because you had a bad business model or, or because you're a bad manager or something, but because you took some kind of risk that either you weren't aware of or that you just got unlucky um, or maybe didn't have some kind of strategy for getting past if uh, things didn't go your right, the right way. Um, and I, I don't really know a better way to like navigate all of that, all those kinds of tasks besides being really well informed, having a plan, sharing that plan with a lot of people, getting as much advice as you can and finding all the help that is available to you. Cause there is a lot of help that's available but you have to know where it is. Um, so that's a lot of the point of the course that we're gonna go through. Um, the other thing that I always like to share is there's a, uh, I remember, I don't know if anybody falls along Chris Newman at Silvan Aqua Farms in Virginia, but I saw him do a, like a lecture at some point a couple of years ago. And the, I can never get this like little quote out of my head of uh, like farmland access for beginning farmers is, is not the hardest thing about starting a farm. You know, it's like not at all the hardest thing about starting a farm, like starting the farm business and selling is, is the hard thing but it's the first hard thing that you have to do uh, as a beginning farmer. So there's no, you know, for me, like as a livestock producer, like I, the first slaughterhouse that I chose for processing my cattle was like a bad decision, but I could change my slaughterhouse. <laughs> you know, I can't change where I'm leasing my land just like that. Um, and I think that's sort of what, what that quote kind of means to me at least is like, you know, farmland access is not like it's not the last thing that's hard that you're going to do as a farmer and it's a thing that you can overcome uh like you know it's the thing you can achieve but um it's you're really locking yourself in with a lot of these decisions that you're making when you're um getting acquiring land tenure whether that's a lease or purchasing um you know you could be locking yourself into one of your biggest 
monthly expenses if you're if you're you know buying with a with a mortgage. So all that's background, and hopefully we'll get more optimistic as this goes. <laughs> um, sharing my screen. And I think I want to share this one. Okay. Are we seeing, we're seeing the Finding Farmland course, yes? I'm going to try to pull this up. I'm going to hit nuts. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is, this course is just at youngfarmers.org slash finding farmland course, finding dash farmland dash course. And I missed an S. Uh, I missed an S. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so it's just a little welcome page explaining everything. There is a Spanish option, but the Spanish is not like an exact replica of the course, mostly because there, this course is like has a lot of um, activities that it links to and resources that it links to that like don't exist in Spanish. But at least this Spanish version course is the best compilation I know of of like land access resources in Spanish. Um, but in the English language one. Um, it basically goes through nine lessons, and we can maybe walk through them quickly one by one. Uh, and within each lesson, the first one's more intro, so let's jump to the second one just to see what a real one looks like. So within each, and excuse my rural slow internet, <laughs> within each lesson, there is typically like one um, kind of like blog posty article about the topic. Uh, there is an interview. So this is actually with, uh, Kathy and Mike from Land for Good, the organization where Jay works. Um, so some kind of interview about the topic and then um, a video, which is usually a walkthrough of me using the Finding Farmland Calculator, which we will look at next, um, which explains the topic and some kind of, you know, kind of hooks it back to the calculator tool. And then there is usually a practice activity, which is usually some kind of worksheet, often something that an organization like Land for Good produced. Uh, that ties into the activity, uh, and then a whole bunch of resources that um, can be, you know, in one way or another, useful related to the topic. One that I want to I want to point out here that Jay mentioned before: there's all these land linking programs in other states. So at some point, I haven't kept this compiled in like a year or two now, and I don't work at NYFC anymore, so I don't know if anybody has been updating it. Uh, but this is as of October 2019 all of the land linking um, organizations throughout the country that you could just link to. So if you don't live in Northeast News, New England, Farmland Finder, all these other ones exist, uh, as long as they're still active. Get out of here. Um, okay, but there are good resources like that kind of throughout. And so the, the course goes through, it has a little introduction to using the calculator tool, talks a little bit about different land tenure options that are available to you. It goes into a financial planning lesson, which is mostly based on um, like projecting cash flows. Uh, I think if you're going to take away any skill from business planning or do any kind of task in business planning, is just projecting cash flows. Uh, this is the kind of activity that I wish we maybe had time for, but we don't necessarily have to have the time for because if you click here, I have a demo of me walking through a projected cash flow and the template that I use for it. So you're interested in that, you can go for it. Um, but in terms of just like financial risk management, just knowing what you're projecting to spend um, and knowing what your what your goals cost, basically, what your goals are gonna cost is, and when you need to achieve certain things by, or when you need to purchase certain things to achieve those goals, I think it's kind of the key element of business planning. The rest of the business plan is just explaining your cash flow budget. I don't know, that's the way I think about it. Um, so the financial planning kind of leads um, naturally usually into this like credit and financing process where, you know, you create this financial plan and you realize, oh, I actually need uh, more money than I have right now and more money than my business can earn in the first year, first two years or three years. Um, so that means that you probably need some kind of outside capital from a bank or from grant programs or from an investor or some combination of all these things, an off-farm job. Um, and we start out by kind of 
talking through like, well, what is credit? How do you how do you get to a point where you can take out a loan? What are lenders looking for? Um, what are the different like financial statements? What are these ratios that people that are banks are talking about? So trying to understand all those kinds of things. Um, and then the financing options lesson, we have a bunch of information about the different farm lenders. So this you know article goes through all the different kinds of uh, sources of capital for farmers from USDA's farm service agency to farm credit, which is a cooperative lending institution to other banks, CDFIs, uh, all over the place. Um, a really great resource here is this uh, FSA loans guidebook. So one of my um, former coworkers at the Young Farmers Coalition, Kara Fraver, wrote this guidebook. Uh, that is basically going through every loan program the Farm Service Agency has and explaining them, and kind of explaining even how call it the lender first opportunity, which is basically the lender that you can go to um, or you should be able to go to as a farmer if you uh, aren't able to get a loan from somebody else. It doesn't always work that way that you can, but that's the intention. Next, we jump into different partners that are available. So this is kind of to help you both like find certain kinds of partners. Like for instance, on here, there's this find a land trust tool where, you know, wherever you are, whatever state you're in, um, there are, oh no, didn't pop up a new tab. Whatever state you're in, there are like conservation organizations that often want to work with farmers to help them find farmland or they're involved in the land linking programs. Um, so if you go to this map, you can find all the land trusts near you and you could kind of search if they have a farmland program and get to their websites. But now I lost the course. Yeah, and there's some other, um, you know, most, a lot of this is focused on like farmland conservation as a kind of partner, but I think like you want to be as broad as you could think about with partnerships like the, um, and people who are investing in farms, like there's a lot of um, like slow money groups in different parts of the country that are willing to like either invest or partner somehow. There's like local foods groups that are often um, willing to be some kind of partner and even just like communities, like people who want to start a CSA. So they want to support your farm with their dollars. Um, all those are different kinds of partners out there. So you want to be as, um, especially if you're in that like disadvantaged position of like, I can't just buy land or I can't just get my business started without help. There's help in a lot of different places if you're creative about it. And then the last three lessons are uh, kind of taking, kind of trying to bring in some information around particular types of land tenure. So leasing farmland, buying farmland, and transferring farmland. Uh, so leasing farmland, some of the tools um, or resources referenced here are some of the things that um, Jay had mentioned or possibly are going to be in future presentations. So like tools for drafting leases and um, yeah, rental assessment checklist is really helpful. And there's a couple interviews here with um, people who deal with a lot of farm leases that uh, have some really good feedback and advice there. Uh, buying farmland obviously is another kind of land tenure. And then the one that I want to spend a little bit more time with uh, maybe is farmland transfers, which I feel like is like a catch-all term for any creative way of acquiring farmland that might end up, might be some kind of lease involved with it, might be some kind of purchase involved with it, probably will be at least one or both of those. Um, but the idea here is that you're transitioning both farmland and a business at the same time, or, and or like farmland and a house where, you know, there's some kind of um, partnership between the, the party that's leaving the farm, the party that's entering the farm that is more than just like a real estate transaction. Uh, and in the, in the like world of agriculture, especially in places like New England, where um, there's not a ton of farmland and often it's very prop, um, often it's very expensive and often there's a lot of competition with people who want those farms as residences. Sometimes these farmland transfers with people who are with retiring farmers that want to see their land stay a farm and who, um, you know, have some kind of value in this land besides its financial value. Like this is, these are the kinds of case studies and examples models that you want to be aware of because these are 
ways that you can acquire land that is probably more expensive than you could buy um, because you have somebody on the other side of the table that really wants to work with you. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of these links are to different like case studies that uh, are helpful models to, to think about when you're um, trying to acquire land. It's also one of those risk mitigation strategies of like why start a business from scratch if you can kind of take over somebody's business that's already successful that you know is already able to um, make enough cash flow to cover the property costs and all of that. Um, so yeah, I definitely advise if you can transition to somebody else's farm rather than starting from scratch, it's the you know, great way to go. Um, okay, so throughout this course, there have been a whole bunch of links to this thing called the Finding Farmland Calculator that I will pull up in over here. Okay, so this is a little companion tool, and this is maybe the more novel thing to our online course. Like the online course is great, but there's you know it's just a bunch of information and different web pages. Uh, this calculator you could get to by going to findingfarmland.org. I'll transfer it right there. And this is a nifty little tool. It's basically a mortgage calculator. So if you've ever like, you know, Google mortgage calculator, you'll find one of these things pop up in Google. It'll tell you like, it'll ask you how much the property price is, what your interest rate is, and um, tell you what your monthly payments are. And that is essentially what this is, but it's um, got a lot more bells and whistles for farmers and a lot more like points of education for farmers. Uh, so we're going to use this with a real world scenario. I had popped open before um, the New England Farmland Finder that Laughing Dog Farm in Gill has nine acres for sale, lease other with a house. So this is one of those farmland transfer opportunities where this is, I believe, CSA farm that they want to retire and they want to transfer their farm and their house. And it seems like their CSA to a new producer or a group of producers. Um, so cool. And they put down a sale price of $300,000 there as a starting point. Um, so fun. Go look at that. That sounds like a great opportunity. I don't know anything about it, so I can't really endorse it, but sounds cool to me. Uh, if you're looking to start a veggie farm or goat farm, it looks like they have goats too. Um, so we're going to put in, we're going to say that we're trying to figure out how to buy this property, $300,000. Okay. And then you're presented with this like list of somewhat confusing things or financial terms you might not understand, but if you don't understand them, um, there's a lot of aspects of the calculator that help you, um, like help you in that process, help you understand. So uh, what do we want to pay this with? Usually when you're buying real estate, you are getting a loan for it. You're getting a bank loan. Um, but the first thing a calculator will say to you, is it's got these like little built-in features that will tell you, or kind of give you advice if you're doing something wrong, like a little warning. So I opened a bank loan, but it told me, oh man, you're, you just opened the bank loan, but you didn't put a down payment. So most banks, when you're buying real estate, are not going to give you a loan unless you're putting down some amount of a down payment. Um, even like the farm credit system, like a co-op lender for farmers is, is doing that just like your local bank presumably is doing that when you're buying a house. Um, so maybe we want to add a down payment too. We're going to say, you know, it's like a farm credit loan. You actually need big old, probably like 20, 25%. We're going to be generous here and say 10% down payment. You see up here, you keep the property price, Let's put the scenario up here, buying laughing dog farm, uh, bank loan. And so the rest of it, we're going to get it long for. And rates are a little bit better these days. Like it's three and a half. So three and a half. Okay. So if you don't know what that means, if you don't know what like we mean by rate, like the interest rate, if you hover over it, it'll give you a little definition of that. If you don't know what amortization is, you hover it over to give you a little different definition of that. Um, and you see it pops out you know, a monthly payment. If you were just paying this loan, you'd have to put $30,000 in cash and to pay off the rest of this in 30 years, there's your monthly payment. But there's all these other ownership costs that uh, I don't know if people always take into account that these are things that you really should know about beforehand because things like property taxes are not going away. Your farm business is going to have to 
create enough income to pay for all these, say the taxes are like uh, $4,000 from property like that and property insurance, say that. So just throw a number in there. Um, and then another warning sign comes in here that there, you didn't put closing costs in there. So we'll say the closing costs, this is like, you know, your bank's gonna have some kind of origination fee on the loan and you're gonna have to pay your lawyer and a few other random things thrown in there. Um, maybe you have to pay for appraisal. Um, we'll say that's one and a half percent of the property. So we also need $4,500. So this is the calculator showing you besides your down payment, which was cash, 30 grand plus closing costs. So you need to have this much cash at closing. So you need to have this much money in the bank in order to buy this thing. And then on a monthly basis over 30 years, this is your payment, including property taxes, property insurance, and the mortgage payment. Um, okay, that's nifty. The calculator does more things, but let's instead build a second scenario. because this is really the point of this thing is to, so now we can build a new scenario and we can look at a way, a different way of buying this property. So we're gonna do a F sale. So maybe before this presentation, you've never heard of the USDA Farm Service Agency and I'm saying FSA loan and you're saying, what is an FSA loan? So you can click that, I'll give you a bit more information about it. It's, an, it's part of USDA, it's intended to um, loan money to, farming, to farmers among other kinds of programs. Um, there's all these different loan programs and we have a nice guidebook that walks you through them. Uh, but say you wanted to use an FSA loan, um, you know, you just click this open and the down payment box, down payment warning doesn't appear. Uh, with FSA ownership loans, you actually don't, you're not required to have a down payment. Often they will ask you to have some kind of down payment or depending on how much that property appraises for, you might have to put down some cash into it. Um, lots of moving parts there. Uh, we have all four um, FSA uh, loan programs that would help you buy farms. There's also, uh, USDA also guarantees loans of banks, but that's not really built into the calculator. So sometimes you can get a loan that's from your local, local bank, but you get a better interest rate or just the bank's willing to work with you because USDA is guaranteeing your loan. So it's another way that they help to finance um, properties for farmers. But uh, these, Loan rates are actually, they're preloaded in here, but they're actually out of date. They haven't been updated since the start of this year. I think at this point, they're like almost 1% lower than this. Um, it's pretty easy to check if you just Google FSA loan rates. Um, but we're gonna do, should we do a simple or a complicated one? Let's do a complicated one. So, so beginning farmers are eligible, beginning and socially disadvantaged farmers are eligible for this program called the FSA down payment direct ownership loan, I think. It's like a down payment loan, they're called. Okay, so these are really wacky, but they're intended to help you if you are um, you know, able to afford a property, but maybe not able to afford that down payment for the property. Um, so the now I've got to like get the cobwebs out of my head of what this requires, but I've got these warning statements to help me. So for this down payment loan, you're required as the buyer to put down 5% of the property value. So we're gonna say 5% of that cost, eh, 5%, why is it doing that? What's 5%, oh, that's why, because I never put in a property price. Okay, so 5%, so it's $15,000 down payment, a lot smaller. And then the FSA down payment loan you're, it's a it's a joint loan between a bank and FSA, often with farm credit and FSA. Um, so you have to add another loan here, and this loan has to be for fifty percent of the value, so one hundred fifty thousand. We're going to say again that we got that three and a half percent rate, and then the FSA loan, um, the loan that you're getting from FSA, is the remainder. So. What this program is really doing is you as a buyer are coming to this transaction with a 50% down payment. It is like from the from the bank's point of view. Um, but the money that you're borrowing from FSA is amortized over 20 years. So you pay back over 20 years rather than the down payment, which you have to pay all in one day. And the loan and the rate on it, which might even be lower than this right now, is like uh, the cheapest money that you can get from any kind of bank anywhere. Um, so let's see what this looks like. 
we're going to put in the same property taxes. We're going to put in the same insurance. And what was this one and a half, right? The nice thing when you use an FSA loan is that you can finance those. So usually when you're um, when you're buying real estate, like you're paying your closing costs and you just pay them in cash. But if you use um, either USDA, like any kind of USDA loans, so rural development loans or FSA loans, you can finance those closing costs. And so that $4,500 being in cash, that could be amortized over the 20 year period of your loan here. So that you're only cash at closing now is 15,000, um, which is the down payment. Okay. So now is when the calculator is fun, is we can swap these back and forth. So this is bank loan, 1630. And this is the FSA loan, it's 1768, and then drops after 20 years. So after you pay that FSA portion of the loan, you're just paying that bank portion, which is about $1,100. And yes, this is like a higher payment, the 1700, uh, compared to the 1600. So you might be paying 150 more a month. But the thing that that loan program does is, so in this scenario, you're having to come up with $34,000, almost, 30, almost 35. In this scenario, you're only having to come up with $15,000 to start off. Um, so this is just kind of like one example of using the calculator. If like this is your limiting factor here, it's like I have to buy a property in a way that I don't have to have like tens of thousands of dollars in cash, not that $15,000 isn't tens of thousands of dollars. Um, but yeah, so if you have that limiting factor, how can you play around these different loan programs? What's available to maybe build a financing scenario that could work better for you? Um, and you could learn a little bit about them as you go. Uh, let's stick with the simple bank loan. And I could just quickly walk through what else the calculator does. We don't have to go crazy with this. Um, but the other things it does is if you are like kind of intensely business planning, like it has all these other uh, sections down below here where you can enter some of your, some of the information from your business plan or maybe some of your information about your current assets um, and current liabilities to understand whether you are kind of like a credit worthy loan candidate. Uh, so just to be, I'm not going to go through everything here, but let's do something here to make um, to make this thing work, say like you have a partner that's making off farm income and your farm income on, I don't know, 30 grand from your farm. Um, okay, I'm a little ignore these. But so it's got these um, ratios at the end here. So this one is repayment capacity because we've entered um, our income and because the calculator has some information on this potential debt that we'd be taking on when we get this mortgage. Um, it explains to you that, great, your debt to income ratio looks good. This looks like the kind of debt to income ratio that if a bank saw it, they wouldn't laugh you out of their office, which often is the kind of thing that you don't even know before you go into meet a, bank, a, a banker and uh, ask about a loan. Like, it, is my request laughable or am I like somewhere in the ballpark of the people that they lend to? Um, so the calculator kind of explains what these different ratios are, like the, the categories of these ratios. And these are some really common ways that uh, lenders and their um, underwriting teams will look at the income, all the numbers that you give them, and they'll look at the property that you're trying to buy or the, you know, the pre-qualification number that you're trying to get. And they'll, they'll make these calculations. They'll say like, no, we can't work with a candidate like you, or maybe, maybe you are the right kind of person that we can work with. Uh, and the kind of, I guess the calculator, the whole premise is a bit of knowledge is power. It's it's really helpful to go in um, confidently to those kinds of um, transactions and, you know, at least have some knowledge before you're, you know, not going in scared. Um, yeah, there's some other kinds of outputs here. This little lease versus buy thing is kind of fun that, you know, I think people are always trying to think like, well, why don't I, like, a you know, I think most people kind of think about real estate as like, you should buy it because otherwise you're just throwing away your money. And it kind of depends like how much that lease payment is, like how quickly you're actually building equity in the property when, if you're in a buying scenario, um, how long you're going to stick with the property. So like, you know, if you want to say for this property, you could get it for a monthly rent of like $800 and, you know, five years from now, you're 
paying $48,000 in rent versus $132,000 in purchasing costs, you would gain some equity in the property, but um, maybe not enough equity to justify spending this much money over five years. Whereas if you're thinking about this over like 20 years, you know, that ratio starts to, I don't know, look a little bit better. Um, and the last thing here is, this is really helpful. So this download as a PDF. So if you are working in some kind of like educational setting and using the calculator, um, once you enter, so the calculator is not like keeping any, any of this financial information. Like as soon as you clear the page, it, it loses all of it. Um, so if you do wanna save something like a scenario that you put through, uh, you just get this one page black and white printout of everything that you put through and all the results are, are there. And that only works per scenario. So if you want to go back to the FSA loan one and have that print out, then you have to click it again. And you get that scenario as a new print out. Eventually. Anyway. Um, yeah, that's the that's finding farmland calculator and finding farmland course. And essentially they're just kind of information tools for helping you every step along the way of thinking about uh, farmland access, whether you're a beginning farmer and have never um, acquired property before, or even if you know, you've know you already bought a house and maybe you're familiar with some of these things, but it's kind of a, a more useful mortgage calculator than um, what exists out there for non-farmers. I think I could stop there and we could go to questions for all of us. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Mike. I always love learning all the little nooks and crannies <laughs> of the tool and all the things that it can do. There's like more nooks and crannies than I even like recall. Like, why did we build this thing? And there is a reason, but. That's right. It's good. It's great. Well, cool. We can um, open it up for questions. I saw one from Kamar um, asking about FSA loans and do they have prepayment penalties? Does anyone uh, know the answer to that? Not that I'm aware of, no. I think uh, a thing to know about FSA is actually they they set up like any kind of FSA purchasing scenario, they're not almost never intended to actually get to the end of that amortization period. So when they say like, you know, direct ownership loans are actually a 40 year amortization, which is 10 years longer than any bank's gonna give you and 15 years longer than like Farm Credit East is gonna give you. Um, they don't actually intend to hold your loan for 40 years. What FSA's intention is always to grab, what they call it, graduate your loans to commercial credit. So at a point in your business operations when, you know, your loan officers and you kind of agree that, you know, I don't actually need this. I could get credit at a commercial bank now. I don't need the like government backed credit. Um, they'll refinance you with a different lender. So I think that's I think that's a thing to remember that this is always like an ever-changing thing that um, especially with an FSA loan, they're gonna want you to go to commercial credit when you can, um, when your business can afford it. Great. And it'll be a little bit of a higher rate when you refinance, right? When you graduate, since the government's subsidizing that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Great. And just a shout out from um, Kina. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, just appreciating all the resources and support um, that you guys have mentioned and um, appreciate your offer to answer any questions in the future. So that's great. And folks, um, I know we're a small group, but definitely feel free to turn on your camera and unmute yourselves and ask any questions that you have. This is your time. We have these great presenters here who have developed and curated all these amazing resources for finding and financing farmland. So feel free to take advantage of their expertise and ask any questions or ask questions of each other. What are you here to learn or what kind of land are you looking for? Are you looking for land or do you have land and now you're wanting to know what to do with it? <laughs> we can have a, a dialogue for the next 15 minutes of our time left together here. All right, so I'll take the jump so we don't have to sit here in silence. Um, you guys, um, both Michael and Jay, kind of hinted at 
that may be a good way to go about finding farmland is to go about finding a strong business model. Um, and I'm wondering if there are similar toolkits or calculators to help with that, um, that take into account like local market context. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, I think doing a business planning course, um, especially since so many of them are being offered remotely these days, can be really helpful. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, New, New Entry does two a year. Um, I'm trying to remember what's what the Mass Department of Ag one's looking like. But uh, the Carrot Project, I know, has some online uh, business planning tools you can walk through, as well as this other one called Ag Plan that's really just a business planning template, but with a specific agricultural lens. Um, I'm trying to think if any of them have a specific calculator like that, where you can, you know, punch in different variables to that end, but, um, but they certainly do kind of walk you through how to make a business plan relative to farming, rather than just like looking up any old business planning resource and trying to figure out how to tailor it to farming. Um, and the nice thing about the class is you get a lot of peer support on that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I think the place that I always turn to for any kind of like business strategy, business modeling advice is really like the world of podcasts and stuff and the, and even sometimes trying to look outside of, um, you know, like I'm a direct marketing farmer, like I sell stuff on online directly to consumers. And so there's a lot of resources out there for like e-commerce businesses that aren't necessarily agricultural specific, but could be helpful. Um, and then there's some like really great farm podcasts out there, like the, for any livestock producer, there's um, this farm, Seven Sons Farm in Indiana that uh, has a like an e-commerce cool tool called Graze Cart. And they have a podcast that just has a lot of great business advice on it around doing like a direct order mailing e-commerce business, like for any model that, that touches on that. Um, I don't remember her name. There's a really great organization for people interested in like CSA farms called the CSA Innovation Network that has uh, a lot of good resources around CSA business models. Um, and I don't remember her name, but there's a really good podcast from one of the members of that. Um, I don't remember the name of her farm, but it's somewhere out in, I think, Wisconsin or Minnesota or something. Um, good ideas. Yeah, I also think like in the local context, I don't know if there's any better way of learning about successful business models than working for other farm businesses that are doing the kinds of things that you want to do. If you could figure out like a, like as you're planning your business, um, working in a place with a, a, a boss or group of bosses that's willing to share information about their model and stuff. Um, I don't think there's any better way than that. Also, um, I would say too, if you're looking to combine business planning and, and lending with the USDA and Farm Service Agency, they um, usually maintain a list of all the borrower certification um, programs that they certify that are eligible. You know, if you take one of these borrower certification courses, a new entry is one, the CARAT project is one that were mentioned, but there are others across the country that are listed and those may be good opportunities as well to connect because then you kind of get a, a not a, I wouldn't I don't know if it's a leg up, but you've kind of passed one of the check mark boxes on your USDA Farm Service Agency loan application if you've taken a certified borrower training program. I will say that I think you really hit the nail on the head, Kamara, though, of like the like figuring out a profitable business is the thing that has to come first. And it's actually, it's weird because it's like not possible to come first. Like you need the, you need some kind of land tenure to get a business started. But the, if, I think like, if you're thinking about in this risk mitigation context, like you need land tenure that fits like the, the path of your business model where like you might not need like a, you, like at a certain point in your business plan, like five years down the line, maybe you need some kind of um, land and infrastructure resources that you don't actually need in your like one, two, and three. So like, don't like spend your time, don't spend your money on the land resources and infrastructure resources you need in the future, like get the bare minimum that you can to like test out a business model in a place. And um, yeah, don't lock yourself into something if you haven't proven the model to yourself at least. Absolutely. 
And yeah. that, that goes into land tenure changing over time too. The fact that people start out leasing sometimes and then scale up or purchase or scale back or relocate. So just being being as light footed as you can with something as, you know, permanent potentially as, as farming land, I, th I think can be helpful in that risk mitigation sense. And in, in terms of like land tenure opportunities in particular, like once you start as an ag producer in a place, like the things, things like that, opportunities like that start opening up to you because of the kind of like grassroots strategies that Jay mentioned, like there are a whole bunch of people who are not on these land link things. There's no way to get in touch with them, but they'll notice like, oh, this person opened like a little farm stand shed here. Like maybe they want to farm this, this like land that I've, you know, had in my family forever and never mentioned because it's just like not something they think about. Um, but those kinds of things open up to people who are just like in business in a place, I think. Yeah, I can say that from our experience too. We were literally just one town over for like 10 years. And, you know, there were a lot of vegetable farmers and a lot of the land was locked up and we were trying to graze livestock. And then we moved one town over after we got kicked off our other land. And now it's like, you know, we're taking good care of these fields. People around town are seeing how nice of a job we do. And I feel like we have more land offers than we ever had, you know, for 10 years in another like, town, literally three miles away. Because people are just like, you know, like literally wealthy landowners, like, oh, come farm your pigs in my five acre front yard. <laughs> like what? I mean, it's just been crazy. People want to see it. So, you know, there are all kinds of crazy situations. And I think that gets into the topic that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks is really building a solid lease as well, because sometimes, you know, people get excited to offer you land and they don't really know what that means. And, um, you know, having a really good solid written agreement is really key to protect, you know, to manage risks because you don't want to start something and, and invest in any way, shape, or form if somebody on the other end, the landowner, doesn't really, you know, isn't willing to put that in writing because that's that's a lot of protection for you. Yeah, never trust a. I don't know if this is totally mean to say, but never trust a non-farming farm landowner. Is my <laughs> rule of thumb from coming from somebody who leases land from non-farming farmland owners. Uh, I just find it's like if you're not if you're not farming land if you don't like know what it is to run a commercial farm it's just like you just don't know what it is you don't know what the, that farmer needs or the kinds of protections they need or um yeah so it's not don't work with non-farming land farmland owners but don't trust them yeah I, I can second that and even you know so much of that can be completely unintentional they can have the best intentions but just yeah. <laughs> you know i yeah think things they just don't doesn't occur to them or they've got an opposite view on that so yeah but well that, that's that's great we'll definitely dive into some of that on leasing too about ways to protect yourself cool other questions Mar, you look like you want to ask another one. Don't feel shy. No one else is stepping up. We're happy to ask, answer all your questions. Well, you know, step up, step back. I just want to make sure I'm keeping space for everyone else. Go for it. So um, one question I have, which is really just born from experiences. <clears throat> I'm in Pittsfield and there are seems to be like there's a lot of potential opportunities to access land, um, but almost a lot of um, education is needed or convincing or coercing um, people into realizing um, all the opportunities. So one in particular I wanted to mention, because I think you brought this up, Jay, that there sometimes are public lands that potentially could be used. And if um, there's a different process for tenureship when it comes to public lands and what that, um, the benefits and maybe some downfalls to what that could be. Sure, yeah, no, I, I love that question. And this will be a little bit of a preview of the, of the leasing session, but I'm happy to, happy to answer that right now. Um, so yeah, with, with public lands, it can be a little bit tricky due to it, um, especially if it's you know municipally or, or state owned land. Um, it can get a little bit dicey to have a legal interest in publicly owned land via a lease. And so um, all or even most of them use licenses instead of leases. 
which really is a temporary, um, it's it basically a temporary use agreement, but without a legal interest in the land. It's basically permission to be there written down, still have protocol written out. Um, but a lot of it can be terminated at a moment's notice rather than a lease where you, you know, so long as you don't do anything wrong, you're guaranteed to be there for the length of the lease. Um, so, th so that can be a downside of it. But um, the, the plus side is that's, you know, they want to keep up public relations most of the time. A lot of times when, um, you know, town, state owned land, et cetera, is being made available, you know, they, they can't run around burning farmers and then having it come, you know, um, getting that kind of reputation that they won't hold on to their agreements with the farmers. So, you know, it's, it's, a it's a bit more public facing from everybody's perspective than with a private landowner a lot of the times. Um, so, you know, it's just being aware of the different nuances there and, and being really clear in that communication and negotiation piece of what the expectations are um, from, from my experience. Great, and I see Jordan added to the chat, the Southern Arizona Young Farmers and Ranchers Coalition just went through a process to be part of a county land lease and got it. So that's great. Yeah, uh, it's a National Young Farmers Coalition chapter, Midfoot Coalition. Um, so if I, I can put my contact, if that might be helpful for, there are other people who are more involved in that than me, but went through a county process, different state, different county, but were able to achieve that. Great. Thank you for offering that. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. I just want to say hi. Um, I really am bummed. I just arrived to this meeting. Um, it is going to be recorded. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll because I'm sure some of the questions I have will have been answered. So, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Wanted. No problem, Matthew. Yes, we're recording. We recorded the whole session. I'll email it out to everybody who registered and it'll be on our posted on our website. So lots of opportunities to go back and, and watch all the resources that, that Jay and Mike just presented. So. Okay. Okay. Also, hi. Hi, Jay. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> I appreciate your comments, uh, <laughs> Kamar. Yeah, I know. I think one thing, and I don't know if this is what you're getting at by your comment, but one thing that New Entry used to do around, um, we used to do educational events with communities that were interested in leasing land to farmers, and we partnered with Land for Good to do this, but um, we would work with agricultural commissions, land trusts, um, by local groups, whomever in a community, because a lot of the farmers that we work with that were trying to transition off the incubator farm are looking for land in, in their next steps. And some of them wanna look for land in a particular community. And that really shrinks your search area a lot. So we had to get pretty creative in terms of how we reach non-farming landowners, but also other people, you know, land trusts or town owned land or things like that. So we would do these community meetings at Grange Halls. And one of the things that we really tried hard to do was I would do a, a PowerPoint of what a vegetable farm looks like and what does a livestock farm look like? Um, because you know a lot of people think of a farm and they wanna see the hay being mowed once or twice a year, thanks Jay, or you know the beef cattle grazing out there and you know maybe moving around with a few animals. But you know a vegetable farm looks very different when you've got high tunnels and lands tilled in different fields and lots of different vegetable and intercropping and tomato steaks and tall sunflowers over here. And then the post-harvest wash area and a cooler and like the infrastructure is very different from looking at what maybe was conserved farmland, but someone's just been hanging it. And so really being clear what that visual impact looks like and what, what the business needs are, I think sometimes can be like an alien invasion. And I don't know if that's what you meant by your comment, but I feel like, it's really hard to get people to understand what it will look like if they don't see images of it because it doesn't quite exist yet in their community. And without going into it like eyes wide open that most farms are messy because farms are too busy to clean up during the season and they're just go, go, going. Um, it is a really important thing to communicate up front, even though it might feel like you're shooting yourself in the foot. I always feel like it's better to throw that out there and paint that picture before it happens and then your land your non-farming landowners like this isn't what I thought it was going to look like or I wanted the Martha Stewart version of this and this is not it. So another good reason to write it all down in a written agreement. But, great. Well, well, we're at, 
Um, go ahead. Sorry, Jay. Oh, no, I was going to say, I'm glad you said that. And, and likewise, being clear about what, you know, if it's a public landowner, being clear about what their expectations are for the land also. A lot of times they want to keep it open, open for recreation and, and just making making sure it's synergistic and all those things are out there front and center. Well, we're just, we're at time. Um, so I wanted to uh, just pop up our post assessment um, poll. If those of you who are still online, um, don't mind just answering those two questions again about your knowledge about finding farmland and financing farmland. So hopefully that'll just take a few minutes and I wanted to thank everybody for coming um, and thank you to Jay and Mike for sharing your information and knowledge. I really appreciate it again. And thanks to our funder, the Northeast Risk Management Education Program for investing in this workshop series. And I will definitely follow up with an email um, to everyone tomorrow with the recording of this session and all the resources I've been taking notes online <laughs> as we've been going. And I'll include all the links and everything um, to the things that both Jay and um, Mike presented tonight. So you can follow up with those and have everything in one easy place to find that. And I'll also post those links on the website as well. If you ever lose the email, you can go back to the website and find all that great stuff there. So. Thanks again, everyone. Appreciate spending time with you all tonight. And if you have any follow-up questions, again, um, I'm sure Jay and Mike will both be happy to, to help connect with you um, and yeah, continue to help you in your land search and think about financing the land. <laughs> it's a big, big jump. So thanks again, everybody, and have a good rest of your evening. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry.